Well, everyone, I really, really wanted this video to be the reveal of the new car, but eh, man, this weather is just crazy. It's like been raining all week, and of course now we have another hurricane coming, and this one's, you know, like heading towards me. Being in this part of Florida, you kind of escape a lot of the storms. Usually it's the coast that gets hammered. But the way this new hurricane's coming in, it's gonna come into the county we live in pretty much head on, like the cone of the storm will be likely over our county, which means we'll likely see some of the highest winds we've seen for hurricanes in the two years we've been here. So that should be interesting, but because of this weather, I can't record the video of the new car. Um, I mean, of course I could, but it, it's not how I want the video to be, so I gotta wait. So I figured while I'm waiting, maybe it'd be a good time to talk a little bit more about what was going on with Buster. I was kind of very vague about what was going on because I wasn't sure what was really gonna happen. I wasn't sure if the deal was gonna work with the new car or not. And, you know, I didn't wanna to say too much until I knew for sure. Now I know for sure, and Buster is officially gone. The new car is officially here. So I think I can talk a little bit more now about what I think and what I know has gone wrong with Buster. So, uh, yeah, let me set you down here. We'll have a talk. Okay, so, yeah, I know it's upsetting. Trust me, it upsets me because after all the work I had just put in the Buster, I was excited to maybe explore what this EcoBoost platform was really all about. You know, like the MA Performance short block was rated to 650 horsepower, but I've read, I've seen that people push those components a lot further into the sevens and 800s without problems. I think 650 is kind of like, we're pretty sure, you know, we're like 98.9% .9 sure you should be good at this power level. Beyond that, we can't guarantee anything. So even though it could hold up, you know, that's what I'm saying. I was really not looking to do this. I know a lot of people are upset of my departure from the EcoBoost stuff altogether in Ford, actually, because the new car, the one thing I will say even though I'm not giving it away just yet. The one thing I will say is other than the Fiero, this is the first, oh, well, I don't know how to put it. It's not my first car ever that wasn't Ford. I've had a couple cars, but they weren't my choice. I had to take over our family um, Toyota Camry when my first car got rammed, which was a Ford Taurus. So outside of that car, uh, the Fiero was my choice to get something that wasn't Ford. This is the newest car I've ever had, and it's also the second car I've ever had um, that wasn't Ford. I wasn't ready to make my departure. It's upsetting, and I know a lot of people who follow me for the build, and I was actually making some decent progress, considering all things, um, considering I was doing my best to, to learn everything myself, the tuning, the work, all of it, it was tough. It really was, but I was, you know, getting a little bit better at it. I was, the car was getting pretty quick, doing really good with the secondary fuel system and, and the boost, how I had it. And it wasn't even done. Like I know for my logs, I could have added so much more timing in it. It was really cooking. It was definitely, over 400 wheel horsepower. I'm pretty sure that it was a little bit quicker than the stock uh, GT Mustang. I was ready to go all in. I really was. I, I was ready to start doing turbo upgrades. Um, I actually wanted to upgrade the stock turbo and see what would happen. I wanted to, you know, explore some other things. Hell, I was even considering putting nitrous on it, you know, trying to get away with the smaller turbo. Um, and I wanted to see, you know, maybe hit it with a 50 shot of nitrous and put me over 500 wheel horsepower. I was ready to really go in on it um, because I was feeling more confident about the new setup. You know, I'm like after I was dialing it all in, working out the kinks, I was really feeling good. So it's a bummer, trust me when I say it, for me to leave 
that car um, because of all the work I put into it. But I was not expecting it to do what it did. I was not expecting, you know, another borderline catastrophic failure again. I financially can't do it. You got to remember the only reason Buster had a new engine is because I had the Fiero to sell. The Fiero is gone now. I have nothing else to sell. So when I'm faced again with a multi thousand dollar repair and I have nothing to make said repair, there's a problem. So it just did not make financial sense to keep the car. Even if I did the work myself, we're talking a couple thousand dollars because I would have to acquire certain tools to do the to perform the job and those tools are expensive. It wasn't feasible, guys. It really wasn't. I know everyone's upset and you all really like the car and I did too. There it was something I never thought I would have, uh, uh, you know, a really, you know, a decently quick four cylinder Mustang. It's it was good, you know. It, it had the power. It still was decent on gas. Wasn't the best on gas, but it, I mean considering all things, it was pretty good um for a, a Mustang, right? And uh, yeah, it just, it would not have made sense. The logic just did not add up to keep the car. And honestly, it just, I could not do it. The money wasn't there. So you gotta be asking yourself at this point, well, how the hell does something happen? How does something break that would cost thousands of more dollars to fix? Well, here's the thing. I discovered shortly after, um, actually, it was on the drive to the dealership trading it in that I discover I had more issues than I thought I did. So I'll get into that here in a second, but I first want to go over the problems with the engine. Okay, so I started getting a P0016 code, which is basically, you know, the car is out of time. The crankshaft position sensor and the camshaft position sensor, they're, they're, they're reading off. I thought this was weird. At first, I'm like, oh, it's probably just a camshaft position sensor. So I ended up replacing it, not thinking much of it, didn't make a difference. So I'm like, okay, let me think about this a little bit more. And I'm like, oh crap, please tell me this has nothing to do with the timing chain. So I look at the code again and I look into it and yeah, it very well could mean that. So I, I did a lot of things. So I ended up replacing three separate things trying to remedy the issue. I replaced the camshaft position sensor. Then I thought, well, maybe I should replace the crankshaft position sensor. So I did that. I replaced the crankshaft position sensor no fix. So I'm like, okay, I really got to think about this. So I plug in the car to log it. I wanted to see what was going on as the car was running. And I noticed the intake camshaft was retarded by 18 degrees at idle, which after comparing it to previous logs, it should be at zero or close to zero. It shouldn't be negative 18 degrees. So right there was a dead giveaway. Something wasn't right. I was like, you gotta be kidding me. The chain must have jumped a tooth or something on the cam gears. This is a problem. This is a real, real big problem. Because while repairing it isn't necessarily, I mean, it could have been as easy as replacing a tensioner, maybe a guide messed up or something, but the get to all of that is a super big pain in the ass because you have to remove the uh, AC compressor, you have to unbolt it so you can get the belt off. I, I guess you could do it without it. I guess maybe if you get something in there and kind of like wedge that belt off because it's that stupid stretch belt. God, I hate that design that goes over the AC compressor um, from the crank pulley. And then you gotta take the crank pulley off and then you gotta take all the other pulleys off and then you gotta take the uh, valve cover off, which take you have to remove all of the things up top and. You know, then you have to get the front cover off, which is siliconed on. And it's just, it's a lot of work just to, you know, fix potentially a, a uh, you know, timing chain that jumped the, the gears, the teeth on the gears. And if you did all that, it's assuming that it didn't jump enough to actually cause a piston to valve contact. I don't think that happened, but that, that's always a risk. That's always a risk. And if it did happen, maybe it was a slight, but I don't think it did because I never heard any sounds. The car never really ran bad. Um, and there was no like misfires or anything other than just 
being down on power because of the camshaft being in incorrect position. Um, and, and not, it's like I, ha I did not have VCT, no variable cam timing. That was, all, I lost all of that. So when I saw all of that, I'm like, okay, there's one last thing I can look at to maybe see if I can replace. Because I noticed that a couple times when I would start the car back up, I would see the camshaft, the intake camshaft start phasing a little bit. It would start um, advancing to eight degrees and then it would go back to negative 18. So I'm like, okay, maybe it's the oil control solenoid for that camshaft. Maybe it went bad. Let me replace it, see what happens. But while I was in there, because I had a hunch that it could have been a timing chain, I did feel the timing chain, at least from where I could get to. It did feel a little loose, but not loose enough where I think it would have skipped a, a jump the tooth. So with that said, you know, I put everything back together. Like, okay, I'm feeling confident this one. This has got to be it. So I put it back in, start the car, check the log, negative 18 degrees on the intake cam. I'm like, crap. Nope, nope, nope. So at this point, the only other thing it could be is the phaser for that camshaft. The intake camshaft phaser failed. It's not controlling the cam at all. I'm pretty sure probably at this point I think that's what it is because the exhaust cam was in the correct position. That never changed. And the logic is that if the you know chain jumped a tooth on one cam, it likely did it on the other. Not to say it has to, because it definitely can just jump on one cam. I don't think that's what it was. I think it's the phaser because I didn't have any sounds of like a failing chain tensioner. You can tell, it makes a horrible noise. You hear the chain flapping around and slapping stuff. I didn't hear that. The car idled really smooth, sounded nice and quiet. That's why I didn't think it was anything like that. I'm pretty sure at this point after all the diagnostics I did and looking back on it, you know, replacing some of the simplest stuff I could replace and still not remedying the issue. Yeah, I'm pretty sure the intake cam phaser failed. And considering I'm already tired enough as it is from constantly having to fix things and work out the kinks and, and whatnot with that car, I was not willing to invest any time into that, you know, it, it just, I just was not willing to do it. I was like, man, I hate to do it, but maybe I'm gonna have to spend spend the, you know, twelve, thirteen hundred dollars to have someone else do this work and just hope they do it right, you know? So then I thought about it. Damn cars don't need new tires. I know I just bought new tires, but they were like 280 tread wear. They wore down really quick as a 280 tread wear tire will do. I bought these Yokohama tires for their performance capability. I still like the tires. I think they're a really good value, but the back tires, more or less, not so much the front, the back tires were gonna need replaced very, very soon. Like I was gonna replace that probably this week if I still had the car. The other part to that was my driver's side rear tire had a nail in it. So needless to say, it was time. So right there, I'm looking at another five, $600 on top of the repair for the timing, you know, the, the cam phaser. I'm looking at potentially 16, 1700 or even more uh, dollars for just to get that stuff situated. I was highly considering it. I had put money aside uh, for repair. I've been putting money aside into a interest accruing account for repairs. It's my warranty account, but it, it wasn't that much. It would have been some of what I needed, but not a whole lot. I was considering having it done. And then I started thinking more rationally and like, Oh, I'm going to have to make the drive up to Maryland here soon. We visit family in Maryland um, during Christmas. That's a long ride. I got to make sure everything is good for that ride. Tires are going to be replaced. I knew the backs were going to have to be replaced. The fronts were pretty good, but I didn't really get a good look at them. I haven't really had time. So there's a possibility I'm going to need all four tires. I was looking at spending a whole lot of money. But before I did that, I wanted to make sure I was making the right choice. I, I you know, I'm gonna, I have to think like an adult. As much as I want to keep my, you know, Mustang, I have to think about things more logically now in life. And I also have to think about, okay, well, 
I have my real estate business, you know, I need to make sure I, I don't neglect that. I obviously have YouTube to take care of and I'm still limited on what to do there. If I get rid of this car, I get rid of a lot of content. You know, I can potentially lose followers because of people who follow this car may not follow the next car. So I had to think about that. I, I overthink about a lot of things, but needless to say, it was not an easy situation because I had to kind of look at things from multiple angles to make sure I was making the right choice before I spent that money on Fix and Buster. So what I thought about is the money I'm gonna put in the Buster, would it make more sense putting that money somewhere else? So that's when I thought about, would it be a good idea to trade Buster in while Buster is still running? Because when Buster's factory engine blew, it wasn't worth nothing, absolutely nothing. And I still had owed a lot more on it. You gotta think, uh, now I have over a whole another year that I was been able to make payments on the car and I got it down a good a bit. Before I was completely upside down had I trade Buster in and it just would not have worked. Plus my credit score wasn't great. So it wasn't the best now, but it was far worse then than it is now. So there was a lot of reasons why I was forced to fix it then. And you know, now I was in a position where I could get financing. So that's what I did. I looked around, I entertained some cars, and then I found this one particular car that I wasn't sure about. I, I knew about it, I've heard about it, I've seen things about it, but I wasn't sure if it was for me. I wasn't sure if I would like it coming from what, you know, I'm used to. 400 some horsepower cars between Buster and the SHO. I wasn't sure if I would like this car, but anyway, I ended up going to the dealership, test driving the car, and I was actually really surprised by it. How nice it was, how nice it drove, the features it had, and its performance potential. I was actually really shocked at how quick this car was, uh, considering all things. Really shocked, actually. It, it really did impress me. It's not impressive as far as, you know, it's not a super fast car, but for what it is, it impressed me. So anyway, I, I'm like, you know what? Let me see what the numbers on this is gonna be before I make the final decision to fix Buster. So we, you know, we ended up working some numbers out, negotiating a couple things here and there with the trade. It got to a point where it made sense. It made more sense to put the money towards a new car than it did the fix Buster. Because at this point, Buster was at 64,000 miles. The engine was approaching 20,000 miles. So I had to think about things. And that's when I said, you know what? This has got to be the way. It really does. It ain't going to be what everyone wants. I am still uncertain about it, but this has got to be the way. This is the most logical use of the money right now. Yeah, that's what I did. And this is where the second half of Buster's problems come into play. As part of the trade, I returned the vehicle back mostly stock. You saw the video, it was looking real nice. I cleaned it all up the best I could. So I get maximum value for my trade. Only thing I did not remove from Buster that I had put on it was the big intercooler and the uh, steer to throttle body spacer because the intercooler is a pain in the ass to get in and out. I was not willing to do it. And the throttle body spacer, I don't know where the original bolts are for the throttle body. They're somewhere and I don't think I have them. So there were the only two aftermarket parts that left with the car, which is fine. Everything else I just put on it recently, I pulled off. So I have a lot of parts I'll be selling here shortly. like the. Granatelli ignition coils and you know I got the Mishimoto stuff that I don't know if I want to keep maybe try to repurpose it for a future project or let go haven't decided yet but you know uh, there, there's gonna be some parts here for sale soon anyway I pulled all that off and I also reverted the tune back to stock well not completely because the stock tune still didn't quite run right so I, I kind of blended some of the tune um, that I have worked on over the, you know, months of tuning it with some of the parameters of the stock tune, uh, just so it didn't have drivability issues. But when reverting back to the stock tune, I also reverted the transmission calibration back to completely stock parameters. And that, doing that, I'm almost certain is what, um, 
made me realize I really had more issues with this car than I thought. The day I was going up to, to finalize the deal, take Buster up and everything, I, you know, I had flash to tune, everything was good. Um, you know, the car was running a little bit better. I adjusted some things so it would idle a little bit smoother with even with the cams being out of sync and all was good. So it was running decent. But what I noticed was immediately I realized I had a huge, huge problem. Leaving out on the main road, I thought I was gonna get ran into because of how the car acted shifting into third gear. You know, shift it in the first gear, fine. Shift it in the second gear, fine. Two to three, there was this massive amount of hesitation. I couldn't understand it. Like, what is going on here? And then it finally, went into third gear, kind of like slipped into third gear, and then it went in the fourth line, and then when it went into fifth gear, it did the same thing. It kind of like, you feel the car slow down, it like loads up, and then clump, the feeling the whole car, like someone rear-ended you. It was harsh. Shift in the fifth gear, and it kept doing it. Every time the car had to go through the gears, it would do it. It was worse when it was an automatic. If you mainly shifted it, it was a little bit better, like in sport mode. But if you were just in normal drive, it was worse. I had to think about this because I was getting really concerned. I'm like, how, how can this be doing this to me? I'm going to trade the car and I can't have this. And I'm like, this is that transmission problem that these have. I'm like, no way. I, I've been thinking there has been a problem with the transmission, but I wasn't entirely sure because I would notice that there would be some weirdness between those shifts, but nothing crazy. Like it wasn't super noticeable. I'm like, okay, well, you know, maybe it's starting to wear that part. I kind of thought that was what was happening. Not that I didn't know that the part had actually already weared. Uh, to, to the point where it was a problem. And that's exactly, I knew what it was. For anyone who's not familiar with this, there's plenty of videos around. I can show a couple clips here or something. If you own a Ford 10-speed transmission, let me give you some bad news. This is the new TSB out for the 10R60 and the 10R80 transmissions all built before the year 2024, all the way back to like 17. Here's the TSV number 232250, and this is a long TSV with a lot of information. I wanna tell you what the actual problem here is, what you need to be concerned about. Here in front of me, I have two CDF drums out of a 10R80 transmission. So this drum is called the CDF drum because it houses the C clutch, the D clutch, and the F clutch. The actual issue with the CDF drum isn't the drum, it's the bushing that they put inside the drum. Now I want you to pay close attention to these three holes, right? One, two, three. And then if you look kind of from the top at mine, you can almost kind of see uh, almost resemblance of a hole right there. Now I want you to come from looking at that over to looking at the new one. Now notice one, two, three, but they're much bigger holes, right? They're a lot bigger. And then on this side, see, we can fully see. That is because this bushing has slid. That line right there is where the bushing used to sit. You can start to see the feed hole that would be feeding one of these feed holes for the CDF. And then the bushing is supposed to sit on this hole. The top Teflon seal here is completely gone on our shaft. That is because that bushing slid. And if you own a 10 speed and you're starting to have weird shift issues, I almost guarantee this is your issue. That's why now there's a class action lawsuit against Ford regarding his transmission and this exact problem. I got stuck pretty hard by Ford with this car. It's one thing to say that I could take some responsibility for the engine because it was modified. Uh, even though under no circumstances do I believe that the original engine should have failed, especially in the way that it did. And then for Ford to completely, you know, blacklist the car for future repair, it's almost like they knew this car was gonna be a problem and they didn't wanna be stuck with putting out repairs. And of course now, after all said and done, you know, you gotta think, manufacturer warranty for powertrain on Fords is five years, 60,000 miles, 64,000 miles. Now the transmission has a problem. And that's what I've read. A lot of times it's around 60 to 70,000 miles. This problem occurs. How great timing, Ford. Right after your warranty expires, of course, unless you have a, you know an extended warranty. And all said and done, 
on top of having to get that cam phaser fixed or whatever was going on with that fix, now I was looking at a transmission rebuild. I think I could have done, I've watched transmission builds of 10 or 80s before. They are a lot. There was a lot going on inside of them. I think I could have figured it out. Even if I did the work myself, at that mileage, I probably wanted to opt for a full rebuild. So I'd have to get a whole full clutch kit, make sure everything was cleaned out, make sure no other items will wear down, get that revised drum to put in there, put it all back together and hope I did it right. Even that, I'm probably looking at another thousand dollars. Plus I would have to spend uh, 14 or so hundred dollars for a set of quick jacks so I could lift the car up high enough to pull the transmission out and down. So, you know, there is another couple thousand dollars. If I paid a shop to do it, I'm looking at probably four thousand dollars five thousand dollars maybe to have a transmission rebuilt and then there would be the option of putting a used transmission a lower mileage 10 already back in which would have been the cheaper solution but then i'm still faced with that transmission taking a crap so yeah you see where this you know made so much more sense just to get rid of buster i was thinking about it i think the only reason i didn't know that i had the transmission issues is because the car was tuned. In my tune for the transmission calibration, I had upped the line pressure. So I think by forcing the transmission to run a higher line pressure, that actually helped it um, with the weird part. It wasn't as noticeable. And then when I flashed the tune back to, to factory and then the factory line pressure, it was terrible. So I think the tune was really the only thing saving it. So it's kind of like if you're having the problem, having the uh, transmission calibration with up line pressure will make it less noticeable and make the car drivable. You know, you can't, you could not drive that car every day with the transmission clunking like it was after flashing the factory tune. It just would not work. So I think that's why I didn't really notice it. it. It sucks that this car treated me so poorly. You know, a lot of people have had great experiences. I've also know a lot of people who haven't, you know, through my whole journey with the car and rebuilding it, I had a lot of people chime in, you know, and come to me with, with concerns and complaints about their experiences and they've shared their stories with me. So I know I'm not alone. I know I'm not the only one who's had these issues, um, but because I've exposed myself to the internet, you know, you know how that goes. It really is a wider spread problem. You know, there, there's more problems with these cars than I think the average person is willing to admit who is into these cars. And I'm not saying it's a bad car, it's just, there's a lot of flaws, and it's a car that has a lot of potential. The EcoBoost platform, four cylinders specifically, the 2.3, has a lot of potential. It's a lot of shortcomings from Ford, and the aftermarket, I don't think, is playing to the strengths of the EcoBoost like they could be. So it's just, it's a tough situation to be in. As I said, I didn't want to get rid of the car. But after explaining all of this, I think you can more or less understand that it just... It would not have made sense. I could have bid anywhere from four to over $10,000 worth of, of repairs. After replacing the engine out of warranty, putting another 10 grand in it, possibly, after spending six on the engine rebuild, no, <laughs> no, no, I'm sorry guys, I can't do it. It doesn't make sense. You know, it made more sense trading it in and putting that money, well, some of the money because i had to put some money down towards a new vehicle it made so much more sense to do it this way i think it will work better out for me because it's a new car it's a new platform that i can learn with and i can make content on and i can bring in people from that camp over to follow me and you know i think it just for growth youtube purposes i think it will work out a whole lot better anyway in the long run i mean i haven't had i've already had so many cars on the channel i can't believe how many cars i've went through uh, since starting YouTube, it's really unbelievable, um, considering all things. I think having that diversity is also important too. So I had to think about all of these things. They were all factors I thought about to make the final decision, but I think it will work out in the long run. I know not everyone's gonna be super excited about the new car, but um, if you stick around, I think you'll be surprised what the new car is capable of. I think it has some potential to be something not crazy, 
but I think it'll be a really, really fun car when it's all said and done. And it's just gonna be a nice daily driver until the next actual dedicated project car comes along, which I hope is sometime next year. I'm really hoping. I'm just waiting to see if, uh, you know, I can get into a home with a two car garage so I have that space to work. And yeah, we can move on to that. But for now, uh, you know, this is what we gotta work with. So the new car reveal is coming as soon as this rain goes away. The sooner the rain goes, the sooner I can make that video and we can welcome the new car and, you know, what I'm gonna be doing with it and all that. So yeah, that will be hopefully sooner than later. But that's gonna wrap it up here. Let me know what you think. After all said and done, after all of what you just heard, would you have done the same thing? Or would you have put that money back into a potentially problematic car? Uh, let me know, put your thoughts in the comments. Otherwise, I'm gonna wrap it up here for the video. You know what to do, if you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. Share with everyone you know if you wanna see more content like this, and you haven't already, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Keep looking out for next Cars Creative video.